um, welcome to SIARC. Um, it's unquestionable that we have never been so connected and social media dependent. Online feeds on personal devices have forever changed our way to look at the same old reality. Social media, as we all know, are predicated on positive reinforcement, and this pleasure-seeking activity has invaded our lives. With that, our dependence on our devices and relative comfort of our perpetually updating apps. Our attention span has drastically shortened, and our brains have been quickly trained to post, like, and share. Amalia Ullmann teaches us that in this world, where everything is fiction, the best story wins. And so I will ask you to imagine with me a story. Um, imagine with me this brand new parking meters for Los Angeles that can detect when you can pull up, when there is a camera, so then you can check on your car when you leave. You can add more time from the app from anywhere. They have a Wi-Fi and you can always um, connect to it. So all through the city, you always have connections. This is the near field communication, Apple Pay, Google Pay, facial recognition, new design that Idris wants to imagine for our city of Los Angeles. Now 22, Idris is a Ghanaian born and Los Angeles bred. He's a self-made entrepreneur and he has made quite a name for himself in the world of technology and entertainment. Similarly to his Generation Z cohort, Idris is a true digital native. From earliest youth, he has been exposed to the internet, the social network, and mobile systems. The context has produced a hypercognitive generation, comfortable with collecting and cross-referencing many sources of information, and with integrating virtual and offline experiences. Generation Z can also be described as a future creative class with young artists, musicians, photographers, directors, and influencers that find their voices in a new world of content, creation, and functional narratives. His mission is to bridge the divide between the tech industry and minority communities and to bring good design to everyday objects. His focus is app development, product design, industrial engineering, healthcare, and truly being able to bring together technology and culture in the seamless way. How can design be attentive to our contemporary culture to improve our world? Do we have the same answers? Do we have all the answers? Are we looking closely enough? So, Sayark, welcome to 2044, as Idris says on his website. Please join me in welcoming Idris as he shares his design's ethos, practices, and perspectives on the role of culture and design in our technological era. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for that intro. That was, um, that was, uh, that was super amazing. Uh, good evening to you all. Um, <laughs> I think it's paused. Okay. I don't know what, um, I think we're experiencing some technical difficulties. <laughs> First and foremost, um, I would just like to thank uh, SciArc and uh, the faculty for allowing me to be here um, amongst the future. Um, I've truly been, uh, I mean, just blown away with the amount of innovation um, that comes through these doors every single day. Um, as somebody that's, you know, still young, I mean, 22, um, I just find it amazing that um, just young creatives are capable of creating some of the ideas that I've seen. Um, earlier, I was talking to the students, and I was explaining sort of my ethos for um, just how I view uh, architects. And I look at architects in the same vein as we look at doctors. And whereas doctors heal, 
or they find cures to diseases of the human body and the anatomy. Um, I look at architects, designers, product engineers um, as uh, the healers of the design world. Um, finding those viruses, finding those bacteria um, of the design world and providing solutions to those things as well. So who am I? <laughs> Uh, my name is Idris Sandu, I'm 22 years old. Um, I would define myself as a creative architect or architectural technologist. Um, really, um, before I even go into my background, I like to start with just you know some fun facts about me that most people probably <laughs> don't know. Um, I make music, some fire music at that, <laughs> if you ask me. Um, and I speak about five different languages, um, three of those being dialects, and um, two of those actually considered languages. Um, and I'm a big gamer. Um, I'm a huge gamer, uh, specifically. I love computer gaming. I just got this new computer that has a GeForce RTX 2080 Ti chipset, and it is amazing. It's phenomenal. <laughs> and really, um, my background, um, I think I've had a very unconventional uh, approach and background. Um, I was born in Ghana, uh, in West Africa. Uh, I came here when I was still very, very young. Um, I predominantly grew up in Compton. Um, we later moved to Harbor City. And I'd always been a very different kid, uh, as my mom would say. Um, I would always break up all her phones and all her remote controls and try to remap the transistors and the lights and the infrared sensors to do different things. Um, and ultimately, uh, when Steve Jobs unveiled the first iPhone in 2007, um, that changed, I mean, my life. Uh, and it wasn't more specifically with the product in itself, but how he presented it to the audience. Um, presenting it in a way that was focused on uh, a, a tr a, almost a triality of three different things, right? Um, he didn't present it as one singular device. In fact, for the first 15 minutes, the audience thought they were getting three separate products, an uh, internet connecting device, a, uh, a cell phone, and a music player. It wasn't until about 15 minutes after he started that he drew all those connections together and stated that they were getting one device, the iPhone, which was a combination of all three things. And this was really, I mean, for me being 9, 10 at this age, uh, this was the beginning of sort of my evolution pattern of sort of my design thinking process. How can I create one unified solution, but in itself, that solution could be alchemically applied to several different avenues and facets to uh, fix several different problems. Um, after being inspired uh, by that, and after the second version of the iPhone coming out, um, thank you, I would later uh, start going to the library um, for about two years straight, uh, from Compton to Harbor City, just reading programming books, um, learning about operating systems. It was there that I learned about programming languages like assembly, which is essentially machine code. Um, it's really low level access uh, programming. Um, I would also learn programming languages like C Sharp and C++ and PHP and several others. I really didn't know how to apply any of this. I was just simply just learning after being inspired. Um, it wasn't until I was noticed by a Google engineer that would um, later be a very uh, important person in my life that would allow me to shadow them at Google um, at 13, <laughs> that I had an experience to uh, have, have, a, have a very diverse insight to how software management actually worked. And again, just like the Steve Jobs keynote, my design thinking process and sort of my mind was being evolved and not only challenged, but uh, really assisting me with adaptation and an adaption to my environment. Um, so I like to refer to my, uh, my period in, in tech, you know, pitching ideas and consulting with companies like Google, you know, Uber, Snapchat, um, Instagram as the dark ages. <laughs> um, the era where I was really working um, behind the scenes, uh, even despite being so young, having the opportunity to be in meetings and settings that the average kid from Compton or Harbor City would never really have access to. Um, the light age is probably what most people recognize me for. Um, my work with uh, hip hop artist Nipsey Hussle, um, you know, the work with Jaden, the work with Kanye, the work with, you know, Apple. I mean, doing a, a class on biomimicry at Apple. That's really the, where the start really becomes. 
And um, we're sort of on this next wave, uh, the ethos DNA era, um, which I don't really know what time period that will fall in, um, but it will probably be the 2044 ethos that we embody. Um, and that's really just sort of the future of where we uh, want to focus most of our energy on creating innovative solutions, not only for um, minorities, not only for uh, disenfranchised communities, but really just everyone. So we're here at SciArc, and <laughs> I'm sure uh, everyone here, from faculty to students to even guests here, um, are very familiar with this, with this term, um, architect, um, from a noun perspective. Um, and an architect is known as you know, someone who designs buildings and in many cases also supervises their constructing. Um, that's sort of the wide adopted um, definition of architect. Um, some notable you know, architects that I admire personally, you know, Frank Gehry, um, David Ajay, um, Sal Hadid, very phenomenal, incredible individuals. And these are real architects. These are people that you know, are accredited, that have done a lot of work. And you know, I use the term architect, and I feel like um, there might be like a, well, if you're an architect and you know you do these things, like what credits you as an architect? Um, but I think I don't uh, use architect as a noun. Um, in fact, we've been using architect as a verb. And I strongly believe that a lot of things uh, that refer to a process should be referred to as verbs. Um, so architect as a verb means the ongoing process of taking a figment of an imagination and turning it into an actual product, turning it into an actual ideation. And that's really a lot of what my work embodies. And so now I think we can focus more on design, right? Um, we hear design a lot. That word is uh, often used in popular culture. I mean, in, uh, in just it's found in pretty much every avenue or facet, um, from education to application to so many different uh, parts. My favorite uh, definition of the word design is probably from a um, German-based product designer, um, arguably to me one of the most impactful product designers um, of the last five <laughs> decades. Um, Dieter Rams. And uh, Dieter um, once famously defined design as the total configuration of a product, which I really resonated and loved with. Um, now, for me, being in tech, uh, design simply almost exponentially means the same thing. Um, but I think for me, um, designing, I would proceed based off of uh, the way that Dieter would define it, I would further add that. Um, in tech, design refers to the total configuration of a product, um, but relating to its software and its system, right? Its hardware and its software. What are the relationships between the software and hardware? Is the hardware equally on par with the software? Is the software equally on par with the hardware? Um, are we designing systems uh, with um, you know, respects to the systems that actually go into creating hardware and software. Um, these are some of the things that I, I think about all the time. For me, design in tech ultimately cuts down to the hardware and the software. If, um, you know, to me, uh, tech was a building, um, it would not only be uh, the constituents of what make that building up, but also what was the purpose or what is the purpose of the building, and more importantly, what uses does it have? Um, is it based on alchemy? Is it rotary? Does it change? Uh, is it one day it can be used as a lecture hall, the next day a dining hall? You know, um, these are some of the things that I, that I think about. So I think, you know, for me, um, I really wanted to base this, not only lecture, but really what I think of a, as a stream of consciousness, um, as some, some, design aesthetics that I not only apply in my everyday life, um, but really blurring the lines between culture, fashion, and technology. Um, when I think of some of the things that we've done in the past, um, I think it, it, it'll be easy for anyone to look at it and think, oh, this was just an idea that was created. But you know, how did we apply, for example, the 10 principles of design that Dieter Rams exerts into creating the product? How did we respect principle number six, which states that good design is honest and products should be honest. They should neither 
claim to do something that they cannot deliver on, nor claim to be more than they were intended to do. Um, so how do we draw those connections within fashion and technology and tie it right back to design? And I think for, there's a lot of aesthetics that I, that I use and I convey and I you know, use every day on the projects that we work on, but I just took, I guess, like 10 of those principles that I use on a daily and put, to, uh, put them together in a sort of document form for this lecture. Um, and when I think of designing in a tech-driven age, in, a, in an age where every single thing is not only uh, given to us to be allowed to be remembered, um, but more importantly, given to us um, with respects to not being able to forget. Uh, we live in an era now where everything that we create um, is not allowed to be forgotten. <laughs> So I really think when we create systems and as we start to go into sort of a quantum age, um, we need to start thinking about systems and architecture and how we tie these things together and ultimately what principles or what guides, more importantly, are we going to create to, to, to lead us on that way? Um, for me, a question that I've gotten in the past has been, do you, do you follow rules or are you rule oriented? Are you uh, principle oriented? And I think, I'm not for rules nor against them, but I simply respect that they exist. And by respecting that they exist, you can create a subset of the rules in itself and create and invoke certain messages by respecting the rules in itself. So these are just some guides that you know, I follow and I incorporate in some of my works. Um, you know, aesthetics, uh, experience, emotion, sustainability, diversity, interaction, biomimicry, uh, design ethos that we've created called aspirational necessitation, spatials, which is really interesting and I'm excited to talk about that later throughout this, uh, digital alchemy, and digital alchemy. So I guess we can start with aesthetics. And you know, for most people that are either designers, pro you know, product engineers, uh, user experience designers, user interface designers, um, I think aesthetics is really the philosophical study of beauty, right? Um, it all cuts down to beauty and taste. Um, but who's to give taste? Who's to say what taste is greater than others? Is an aesthetic uh, objective reality or is it a subjective reality? Um, these are things that I ponder on and ask myself every single day. Um, in design, aesthetics refers to the visual attractiveness of a product. How does something look? How does it feel? Um, what, what is the physical materials that were used into it? What emotional um, uh, sort of um, interaction do we want to create with the product? These are things that I, I think about as I create products. A good design aesthetic in a product leads to better usability and experience. I think this is something that's very important for design as we think about creating in a tech-driven world. Um, a great interface greatly decides if a user will continue using a product or a service. Um, how many times have you seen a super poorly, inner, you know, poorly designed interface or a poorly designed product? And despite its usability, um, its function, the form was not incongruent or symbiotic with the, with the, with the, with the function, and it led you to not want to continue to, to use it. Um, so with that in mind, why does aesthetics matter? I think because we're drawn to beautiful things, right? We naturally gravitate to the idea of beautifying products. Um, when users visit a website, for example, or try a new app, or even use a new product, they make quick decisions on whether or not to continue using it. Right, so now we live in an age where you attach this with, so, for example, like social media, and uh, the average time someone would spend on something now is what, five to 10 seconds. So you have five to 10 seconds to tell me why I should continue using the rest of my 50 seconds to watch your full video. Right, so the attention span has greatly been altered. So when we create for a tech-driven world, we need to uh, think about aesthetics. We need to think about how we can create products that are really, really, really cohesive and really you know, just contribute to assisting um, the, the user um, in not only utilizing the product, but also going through the process of be, being willing to go through several pain points to get to the end product. Because naturally, all of us really have a threshold, right? Um, if you're using a new product, um, even if you don't understand it, uh, you're not immediately going to stop using it. Um, in fact, 
how many people read a manual in their phone when they first buy it? Not a lot of people. Um, but if you're given just enough user experience, you're given just enough design on how it should be used, even if you don't know how to fully understand it, by it being designed well, will reduce the threshold or the pain point in you trying or doing um, your best to understand how it works. Uh, much, of, much of that decision hinges on aesthetic appeal of design, right? Uh, when it comes to uh, your, the pain point associated with the threshold to you actually continuing to use a product, a lot of it is attached to how well a product is designed. Another reason why it's very important for us to consider aesthetics um, when designing in a tech-driven world is um, a good aesthetic helps and guides the users to be more tolerant of usability issues. Um, so back to attention span. Now, this is an example of a bad aesthetic. Yeah, <laughs> it's bad, <laughs> right? Um, as you can see, there's multiple colors that are clashing. Um, I mean, there's different fonts and font styles. Um, there is no use of white space to invoke a certain message. Um, it's pretty much everywhere. Um, I, would, I would not use this at all. <laughs> Yeah, it's bad, <laughs> right? This would be a bad example of a, a UI. Um, whereas you have a, a good aesthetic like this, um, which we can relate to um, with Amazon's interface. And this is not a promo by any chance. <laughs> um, but it's very cohesive. You have the use of white space to invoke a certain message. Um, it's, it's really, really, really clutter free. And it frees your eyes. It reduces strain and allows you to focus on what matters the most. Um, even though there's a lot going in he on here, um, you have more of a, uh, a greater attention span to want to continue um, to use this, to learn about it because of the design. Um, and so these are some of the things that, you know, I, not only I think about, but I, I allow and ask people that I work with um, to, to factor these in as they design, whether physical products or digital products as well. This is an example of a bad aesthetic applied to a physical product. The first was, um, yeah, we've, we've all seen this before, right? It's like a math equation. It's like, I just got out of school. You know, why should I have to solve a problem to park my car? <laughs> you know, um, this is an example of a bad aesthetic. And in fact, this is a problem not only dear to me, but something that we're actively solving. Um, we're going to be releasing a, a product soon that is going to address um, some of these problems. And this is really bad, like really bad. <laughs> now this is a more better, uh, better aesthetic um, for redesigning that same interface that you saw before with the parking meter and the parking sign. Um, and when we first designed this, uh, this is actually an internal design that we're actually working on right now for um, parking signs and parking meters. Uh, we created this with respects to the 10 principles of design exerted by Dieter Rams. Um, so this is sort of the design thinking that we apply to our products. And what we realized with this, for example, when thinking of the aesthetics that should go into it, is that most people didn't really care about all the different, you know, signs and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, like people didn't care about any of that. They just needed to park within the specific hour and uh, the specific time and just cared only about that. Can I park here or not? So we really redesigned the interface um, to, to focus solely on creating a, a display module, um, which is an e-ink display um, that would focus on the prioritization of a time frame. Right, so if it was, you know, six to five, um, you have two-hour par parking. But using a dynamic neural network system, we would update that. Um, if it was six to eleven, it would be free parking. Um, if it was seven p.m. to six a.m., it would be permit-only parking. You know, using a dynamic system. So these are some of the ways that aesthetics um, greatly helps in influencing um, not only product but. Um, can assist a lot of designers, uh, architects, um, product people in a, in a tech-driven age. Experience. Um, this is another uh, sort of, I don't, I don't really like to refer to these as principles, but guides that I use in my design thinking and, uh, and work process. Um, design is really not just about the object created, right, but also about the way that creation makes us feel, um, how it makes us think or even learn. It's about the human response to things that we make for the world, right? And 
when I think of experience, you often hear, especially in software, what user experience uh, or, you know, as, as it relates to user interface designs, you think of UX, user experience being equated on the same level when in fact these are two separate people. You have a user interface designer and you have a user experience designer as well, um, two separate people. Um, and really, it, it all cuts down to how products make us feel, how services make us feel, um, how interfaces make us feel. And really, um, it, it really taps into, into our deeper emotions. So how do we design for experience, right? Um, we really do this by understanding how humans interact with technology so we can empathize with their pains and figure out how we can make the experiences more useful um, and compelling, right? Experience can be many things, not just digital. It can be structured, it can be reflection, or it can even be something subjective. Um, an experience um, in reality is like the wind, right? It's not a physical thing that you see. It's not a physical thing and even that you touch. It's more of an emotional thing that you seek to connect with. Another um, principle or guide <laughs> that I do my best to understand is really the emotional um, value, the emotion and appeal that goes into uh, designing a product or a system, right? So today we are increasingly designing for the right brain by focusing on the emotional aspects of design and by asking how will it make people feel, right? In addition to how will it look and how will it work? These are the questions now that in a tech-driven world, we have to now start thinking about, right? I think about the uh, Industrial Revolution and what that symbolized for mass production. And now we live in an age, as I was telling the students earlier, where um, anybody in this room right now has the power to reach the whole world instantly with a device, one singular device that can convey one singular message that can be exerted in a quantum way um, to reach masses. And so as we approach an era in which most of the products that are created um, from a software standpoint or from a hardware standpoint will now be able to be quantified to reaching everyone, we now need to start thinking about emotion and appeal. How, does, how is the product presented to all walks of life and not just a specific um, group of people as well? Sustainability. Uh, this is also another principle or guide that I really like to um, invoke in my work and I encourage others to do as well. Um, you know, and really within this sustainable movement, um, you often hear that um, it's not good design if it's bad for the planet, right? It's a mantra of the sustainable design movement, which encourages designers to consider their impact creations will have on the environment and more importantly, people. But I think I've gone a step further um, when I think of sustainability with the products that I either create or the products or brands that I'm associated with. And really, this is the linear way that people think of sustainability. Um, sustainability, um, my product is sustainability if the end product is sustainable, right? If um, the product that is created is sustainable. And I think in an era where we're starting to move into a tech-driven world, this simply will not be enough to be the solution to uh, simplify, eradicate, or even marginalize, marginally um, sort of uh, disintegrate this problem. And so we're thinking of a new way of thinking of sustainability. Sustainability needs to also involve the process, which leads to the end product, right? Uh, your product or products that are created are not sustainable if the manufacturing processes that go into the creation of these products are not equally as sustainable, right? Um, you think of training a neural network, right? Um, to address global warming, right? If the processes that go into training the neural network are emitting more CO2 emissions than you know, even cars, uh, are we truly sustainable? So these are some of the things that I think about and I encourage others to think about as they create products, right? Sustainability beyond the end product. Also thinking about the manufacturing processes or even the design thinking processes that go into it as well. How can we equally um, or incrementally uh, ensure that the processes that go into making the actual product are equally as impactful or sustainable um, even as the end products. Diversity. <laughs> Diversity is a very important thing to me um, and really I think this is a representation of more than just one thing. Um, 
I think uh, if you live in the United States, especially, we're taught that diversity relates to color. Um, but I think there's a there's addiction bias uh, that I've been, you know, uh, noticing, right? And really, when you think of addiction bias, um, a person or individual or group that has the ability to shift the narrative on a word usually controls that narrative, right? Whoever gives the best embodiment of what a word represents defines it for all. So uh, I'm going to focus on two words. Um, I'm going to focus on diversity in itself, right? In the US, at least, when we think of diversity, most people would first think about color. Um, but diversity transcends more than color. It also talks about you know, ethical backgrounds. It talks about ethnical backgrounds. It talks about accessibility. Um, it talks about you know, how people feel. What environments do they come from? What are some challenges they go through on a day? Um, and these are things that we're not only incorporating in our work, but we're encouraging um, mainly designers, architects, you know, product people, just people in general to think about as they create in a tech-driven world. Because like I said before, we're now in an age where we're creating product, we're creating services that serve more than just our immediate environments, right? Um, we're quantifying products. Things are going from simply being of a, mi a micro scale and now transcending to really a macro scale. Um, another word I would like to throw in here that invokes this um, sort of addiction bias is free. Recently, uh, I embarked on a trip to, to Ghana, West Africa, where we're building a state-of-the-art innovation hub. And on this trip, I realized that the word free, the commoditization and democratization of the word free in itself means completely two separate things depending on where you live. And in America, for example, as it relates to the internet, um, we think of the internet really being something you pay monthly, right? So you pay, what, like, you know, a fee a month, and you have unlimited service, um, f you know, from your cellular phone, uh, from your home network, you pay a monthly fee, and you have unlimited Wi-Fi at home. What determines, or the discriminator in uh, this Western-based system is how fast you receive the data, right? Are you receiving information at 10 kilobyte speeds, 100 kilobyte speeds, one megabyte speeds, five, 10, one gigabyte speeds, that's the discriminator, how fast you receive the information. As I started thinking about how we were going to design these curriculums at these schools, I realized that there was a even larger problem. I read an article that said we've created more data in the last three years than the entire of human existence. So therefore, mo mo most data is online, right? And I realized that in places like Africa and in places like Ghana, the diversity as we think of the word free means something completely different. If we created curriculums or if we were focused on visual-based learning, which most youth are, um, most youth love now, um, we're going away from textbooks and text-based learning to visual learning. Now, if you know, you know, when you're streaming video, you obviously use way more data than reading simple text. So if we're creating curriculums, in video format that can be accessed here. You can easily see a curriculum with video content being two gigs, three gigs, four gigs, five gigs. Now for us living here, that's a very easy problem. I mean, a three gig file, four gig file, I can download that using my high speed internet. But out there, they don't have unlimited internet. They have to, they have to purchase data bundles, right? So even though we're creating free assets, it's not free in another market people still have to buy data to access those same levels of information. So that's just another example of not only the, the diction bias and whoever, gets, whoever controls the diction of a word um, influences the masses, but also how we need to think about diversity beyond just color, um, and also think about uh, affordance, uh, think about accessibility and many others. So I think I probably explained a lot, but diversity in itself means understanding that eat each individual is unique, and recognizing our individual differences, right? These can be along the dimensions of race, um, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, um, age, physical abilities, religious beliefs, political beliefs, or other ideologies. And more importantly, accessibility. Um, I think that's also something that we need to focus on with, um, with diversity as well. So when I think of diversity with software, um, I think about how we live in an age now where pretty much everyone in this room probably has some sort of social media service on their phone, whether that's Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, something. 
And I think about these software teams, right? And software teams for so long have been full of, you know, people of the same age, usually young people. Um, usually have computer science degrees, um, often to even a ridiculous level. You hear like, you know, degrees I've never even heard of in my life um, related to, <laughs> um, to, to technical backgrounds. And really, technology is really an ageist industry in addition to everything else. And whereas a lot of industries will rely more, more on ageism as applies to older ages, technology more gravitates to the young. Um, so you have instances where founders or people that create software companies will gravitate and hire people that look just like them and talk just like them and act just like them. Right? But the problem is you can have as many people as you want that look different but think the same and still have a diversity issue. So now more than ever, we're, uh, we're not only challenging but we're also ask, uh, allowing, in, think, allowing people to think on a deeper level um, as it applies to diversity and really just see the ripple effects that not having a diverse team from the ground up really creates. Um, it, it, you know, it, it self-perpetuates in the recruiting process since those teams tend to hire yet more people like themselves until eventually somebody notices that group um, has become a mini cloning factory, right? Um, naturally, we're going to gravitate to people that think like us, that act like us, that look like us. But in the age that we are developing systems that transcend a micro level and uh, further go to a macro level, uh, we need to think bigger. We need to think about diversity beyond, you know, some of the, the really the basic level and think about the higher level. Um, because truly, if having systems like this is where we're, we're going, we're, we're really not doing well with diversity. So why does diversity matter, right? Um, because I've been in instances with people in rooms, um, with execs, um, high level people, and really what I've noticed, especially as a kid coming from tech, um, is really no one really sees the value in diversity from a um, from a profitable standpoint, right? It's more of a ethical and moral thing, right? It's like, we don't need diversity. It doesn't really help us generate more revenue. Um, when in fact, that's, that's false information. So adding diversity is absolutely fundamental to the problem solving process because we all have different life experiences, backgrounds, accessibility, and knowledge that combine to give us fresh insights and different approaches. Diversity in itself gives us the competitive advantage I've worked with teams that have had less diversity and teams that have, um, have access to more diversity and always working with the teams that had a greater or you know, more people that were diverse and not, again, not related to color but also background, um, politics, I mean just so many different things has greatly contributed to being able to create products that were really on a macro level. Um, in fact, software, will, software or hardware um, will really never truly be flawless. Um, but by creating systems in which we're addressing so many different issues because the people that are experiencing them are on the team, um, it allows us to really perpetuate and reach a whole nother level with creating systems. And in reality, diversity, um, to me, as it relates to the lack of it, is also equivalent to limited scope in problem solving. Um, when you don't have a diverse set, um, and people argue that it's not really a profitable thing, um, my answer to that is you're really having a limited scope with problem solving. If you're uh, focused on fixing a larger scale issue and you only have half of the puzzle, how would you ever really fix that problem? I think we can go to interaction now. Um, or actually I'll go to digital biomimicry. Uh, biomimicry is something that um, I've been studying for the last like three, four years and I was fascinated with it since the first time. Um, I think it's interesting because in the tech space, uh, to know more, we scale down. Um, to find uh, some of the largest problems, we have to go really small. Um, we have to go really, really small. You think of quantum mechanics as to dealing with uh, things that are really, really small or really, really hidden. And I think about biomimicry and how it can help us influence not only designing systems um, from a software perspective, but even hardware. Um, I think about some of the projects we're working now, um, studying bees and how they create tessellations um, using he uh, hexagon patterns and how we can apply that to footwear. 
um, to create not only super lightweight, but super efficient and durable materials. Um, I also think about neural networks, and neural networks can be based on ants and how they create not only their colonies, but they also create patterns um, that can be studied to make effective systems as well. Aspirational necessitation. Um, I used to stumble all the times when we said that. Um, and aspirational necessitation is really this design ethos that we've created that we um, incorporate into our work. And really, it's really all about focusing on products from a perspective of solving necessities versus aspiration. Um, if you look at the world around you, you would notice that um, the products that were aspirational, that you really didn't need, products that you wanted, were designed very, very, very well. And you would notice that the products that were a necessity or that you used on a daily basis that you took for granted are designed very, very poorly. In a world with ever-growing problems, um, aspirational necessitation um, seeks out to allow us to think on a deeper level. Um, how do we really think about designing things from a perspective of necessity versus aspiration? And more importantly, how do we take principles, guides, or even ethos is usually dedicated to aspirational products and apply it to necessity-based products, right? How do we take um, the aesthetics usually reserved for higher-end luxury vehicles or higher-end systems and apply that to, you know, scalable systems in a very effective and cost-effective manner. Spatials. Uh, I really love this. I've always loved the word spatial. It just feels good to say spatial. <laughs> and really, spatials to me is really the relationship between uh, the digital, well, the relationship between digital environments within physical spaces. Right? So I think of reality um, versus a simulated environment. And we're living in the reality right now. I'm not, I promise I'm not about to get Neo on you guys, right? But <laughs> I promise. We live in a reality. And, um, you know, we found ways, um, I mean, since the beginning of computation, really, to be able to simulate environments, right? To be able to create simulated environments. We often hear the term virtual reality, even, being able to create simulated environments in the real world. And I think one of the principles or guides that I use um, talks about fusing the reality with the simulated environment in a way that was cohesive, but respecting that they are two separate things, right? Um, the physical does not have to be the virtual. What if they simply depended on each other? Um, what if we didn't focus on symbiotically fusing them together? What if we respected both of them? You don't have to follow the laws of reality, and you don't have to follow, follow the laws of the virtual. What if we simply respected both of them? So respects with, with reality, um, or even with the simulated environment, we can respect the laws of reality, but allows us to simulate our own laws. So this is really how I think about things when I'm, when I'm working, um, especially when I create spatial environments. Uh, within you know, a two-dimensional plane, right? Um, you can only move two ways, infinitely. You can move on the x-coordinate infinitely, or you can move on the y-coordinate infinitely. But creating spatial environments, especially with technologies like AR, you know, VR, MR, XR, um, for you that don't know, AR is augmented reality, XR is experiential reality, or mixed reality. Um, SR is spatial reality, and VR is virtual reality. I think I didn't miss any of them. <laughs> um, but really, it allows us to add another, another um, I guess I would even say a data type, that allows us to not only render um, at a different rate, but create things truly in a very versatile um, manner. Um, within a X and Y coordinate, if I had a limited space to create an experience, I could only navigate either left or right, up or down. Um, but accessing another dimension in a virtual environment in itself allows me to do more things. And more importantly, using depth, I can manipulate a, um, a temporary reality. So these are some spatial experiences like I've created in the past. Um, one with Goff, one with Kanye, one with Jaden. And I kind of want to just explain some of the thought process that I explained on a previous page, but just in a more cohesive way. Um, so the first one is an AR experience. 
um, and it's 3D plus 2D spatials, right? So this object, this uh, just water bottle, is a 3D object that we can actually import, and we can do a 3D scanning of that, and we can map 2D planes within a 3D environment, right? Um, so it respects the X and Y coordinate only. We can do infinite things as it relates to the X and Y coordinate, but we're respecting a 3D environment. Uh, the second one is 2D with 3D spatials. So the canvas plane, which this card is, is a 2D plane, right? So you have the length and the width. Uh, there is no depth to it, but by using the X and Y plane, we can render our experience using depth in three dimensions. Um, the third <laughs> is really a hybrid application, right? So we created a newspaper that would allow immersive content to pop out of it, but the thinking behind it was how do we use a 2D plane to create a system in which an object can be rendered in 2D when it needed to be, but at any time it could tap into that 3D plane. So well, these are just some you know, examples of that. Alchemy, alchemy, alchemy. Um, I love this word. It's one of my uh, favorite um, forms of uh, creating content. You know, this is uh, Wally Beam, and he's the creator of the Airstream. Um, it was a popular form of uh, vehicles, sort of a uh, trailer system that was created um, in the early 40s and 50s. And really, alchemy at its core is uh, the practice of reusability, to reuse that which has been created. Um, after something has reached its usability effect, how do we recycle, how do we reuse things to create completely new experiences? So when Wally Byam first started thinking about Airstreams, he actually um, was in aviation, and he would study different planes, and um, he really got into uh, metal. Um, and he was pondered and thinking about how he could use uh, elements like metal to recreate things after uh, you know, decommissioned um, aircrafts were, were no longer serving the purpose that they were intended to do. So this is an Airstream, right? And this is how we use alchemy in the digital. This is an Airstream here, and I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are popular or familiar with the Johnny Ive. Um, if I were to ask uh, what, <laughs> What does this have in, uh, in common with Johnny Ive? Um, I think a lot of you would probably say aluminum, right? <laughs> um, but today we're not really going to focus on that. Um, we're going to focus on the alchemy of how we're starting to live in an era now due to digitalization as well as creating in the tech-driven age where we can tap into multiple aspects of alchemy. A product can go from one phase created for a specific purpose, repurposed for another thing, and then influence other designers to create something completely new from that in itself. And I think that's what alchemy represents, and this is a perfect way of that. We started with um, the alchemy of using planes and remolding them to create Airstreams, and then we inspired other designers to think differently, like Johnny Ive, who really created the iPhone. And the iPhone is really essentially the, the modern-day Airstream. Uh, respecting the same laws and the same principles that were applied in vehicles like the, uh, sorry, trailers like the Airstream and um, taking it to a whole nother level. And now devices like the iPhone are also being alchemically um, converted into other things to inspire other people. So really alchemy in a digital space uh, is really about the transformation of physics in a simulated environment, which allows content creators to temporarily alter phys physics in said environment. Um, that was an example of uh, alchemy being used in um, a product, or alchemy being used uh, by a designer to inspire another designer, or by somebody that was in aviation and then decided to make product. But what does alchemy look like in culture? And I think there's really been a, a huge cultural moment um, for several decades now that was initially started by alchemy in itself. And uh, that's what Grandmaster Flash, DJ Cool Herc, and Africa Bambata did. Um, taking already existing products and digitally using alchemy to create new things. And that was the birth of hip hop. 
taking already existing products and redefining what those products meant. Uh, this is the first ever flyer for essentially a hip hop uh, party ever. <laughs> so that's how alchemy really works and can really truly shift um, things. Hip hop in itself is a startup that was based on alchemy, a principle that we, you know, in design use oftentimes. So now those are sort of the principles that I use um, in, in a lot of the works that I've, I've done and the works that we focus on. I think now I'm going to show some of uh, the works that we've worked on in the past. Um, one of those being the work I worked with Nipsey Hussle on. And um, yeah, that's him. Um, I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> and we came together and fused his technological uh, sorry, his cultural relevance and my technological know-how to create unparalleled experiences. Um, it was really based on alchemy, and the preferred or really the designated technology was augmented reality, right? And prior to us creating this um, store, uh, the question was, how do we use technology to create something completely new, right? Using existing technologies to create something completely new. and. I think for me, it was really based on thinking of AR and thinking of QR codes and image recognition. Uh, within AR environments, or when I create AR experiences, or when I code AR experiences, um, most people use AR as a form of overlaying or displaying 3D objects. Oh, you know, I can scan this uh, object here, and it can display a 3D um, 3D giraffe or a 3D horse or something like that. Um, I wasn't really seeing any, not only profitable, but scalable solutions. So I asked Nipsey if he was familiar with QR code technology. He was like, yeah, I know QR is a whack. I was like, okay, yeah, QR is cool, okay. But the main problem with QR is it's static and not dynamic, right? Um, QR technology is fixed on a static thing. So if we printed something using a QR uh, code, it would be static, meaning if we wanted to go back and change anything, we would either have to update the URL to where it's going, which is very difficult, or we would have to completely print something new. The beautiful thing about augmented reality and using image recognition is it happens in real time. Um, and you can set those frames individually. Are you um, updating information at 60 frames per second, 70 frames per second, 80 frames per second, or even with devices like this at 300 frames per second? And I was like, what's one of your biggest problems in, um, in, in, in your industry in music? He said copyright infringement. So when I drop a new song, you know, for the first couple of hours, it's on Spotify or Tidal or Apple Music. And after the first two hours, it's halfway across the world on some torrent site. I was like, well, what if we could create merchandise, attach it to unique storytelling, apply some of these principles to it, and create not only a unique product line that speaks to your audience, um, but really drives more traffic to your stores because now you have an exclusive uh, relationship with your consumer, um, your user. So we basically created this merchandise um, that would allow, uh, via an app, for users to be able to scan um, anything that was in the store, um, pretty much anything. And you could have access to exclusive music that wasn't any available anywhere else. And I mean, their sales skyrocketed. People were buying merchandise. People were seeing each other on the street. Um, and I had one shirt, somebody had another shirt, and they were scanning each other's shirts to see what songs it came with. Um, and we were collecting all this data, and he was able to use some of that to create, you know, we had talks about using some of the data to create a, an authentic relationship with his fans that he could connect with directly, like Telegram features. Fortunately, he passed away before we could continue working on that. But it was a success. Um, I mean, everyone heard about it. Jay-Z heard about it. Beyonce heard about it. Like, a lot of people heard about it. So it was really, really cool. And the elements used um, in that store were based on spatial experiences, right? Um, AR, um, VR, and a few others. Um, tying into that experience, how, how will people feel when they use this? Are we creating technology simply just to create it? Or are we using it because it can enhance, it could help us enhance a story? It could help us convey and enhance something to get people to be more hip to it. Um, this goes back to sort of the diversity I was talking about earlier. In fact, augmented reality is not a new technology. Virtual reality even is not a new technology. In fact, 
company since the early 90s and 2000s have been using this technology. But again, whoever creates the diction bias associated with the term gets to control the narrative. I mean, when we first created this experience, I mean, we launched this in the hood. So like, a lot of people still didn't even know what this was or how it worked. And this is you know, how we truly create diverse systems. Um, if we're all in a specific clan or a tribe and all of us are well informed, uh, no one's really impressed by anything we see here, uh, does that mean we're not innovating? Or does that simply mean we're not being challenged? Right, so it was a very, very um, great opportunity for me to go outside the scope of the normal environment that I would be in and challenge myself to create a completely different experience. And um, yeah, we're talking about redesigning the Marathon store now to uh, look really, really much more better um, than, it, than it currently looks and really just upgrading the feature to a whole other level so the Marathon will continue. <laughs> Uh, of work B. Uh, this was an iterative project that I worked on with Virgil um, Ablo, um, and this was really after you know coming up with a case study of what retail could look like in the future. Um, what would retail look like, and how could we push the limits of technology to create unparalleled, unique experiences using some of the principles above, and. I think I'll just play this video and explain some of the things that went into creating it after. I don't know if we could turn the volume up a little bit. So, <laughs> so with with that product, um, with that project, it was really about. I'm not gonna play it again. It was really about just questioning and really uh, thinking about how systems work today and how could how they could look like tomorrow. Um, what if again, just like with software or hardware or reality and um, and 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 the superficial or reality and simulation, what if they didn't have to challenge each other? You know, what if they did, what, what if they were more collaborative? Um, one thing we've actively been challenged and fighting for and against in this tech space is how every company, every major tech company is focused on acquisition instead of collaboration. You know, rather than work with you, we'll either buy you out <laughs> or completely create what you're creating. Um, but you, I mean, if you think about fashion or if you think about music, um, you know, it's not like you rap better than me, so I'm going to buy you out or something, or, you know, uh, you know uh, people prefer your line, so I'm going to buy you out. How about we collaborate and we leave twice as smart? Um, so those were some of the things that, you know, we, we thought about with creating this product and really tying everything back to, you know, what I said before with um, the, the principles that were used. We use forms of digital alchemy um, and spatial uh, aesthetics. Uh, how could we use, you know, state of the art, um, technologies um, and game engines even. Um, somebody would think that that was made in Maya or you know, um, Cinema 4D or something. I made that in Unity. <laughs> Unity is a game engine. Um, I used a game engine in, collaboration, in conjunction with uh, so many different uh, user experience design tools like uh, Sketch um, to create that experience. And really, interaction, right? How would people use this? How would people feel when they used it? And aspirational necessitation. Um, when you think of holograms, uh, although we're not in a, you know, a very distant reality like we would think of in Star Wars, right, um, where you would see, you know, Princess Leia pop out of this hologram, um, we are able to create these experiences in a very unique and different way. So, with digital alchemy, 
it transcends just physics. In fact, with digital alchemy, one can manipulate, uh, convert, or even extrapolate items to reach a desired result. Um, like I said in that previous uh, video I just showed, these were the tools that I used. Um, I used Sketch, um, which is basically a user interface design tool, um, Unity Game Engine, Logic Pro X um, for the music, and Final Cut Pro. In fact, uh, even the audio um, was alchemy of itself. I took a Adidas campaign, <laughs> and uh, it was for the Yeezy Boost. And if you heard the sounds, you can go back and check it. And I chopped up all the samples in there, and I put it at different keyframes within Logic and imported all the 3D animations from Unity Game Engine to create that whole experience as well. So these are how alchemy, digital alchemy works. Um, with digital alchemy, uh, it allows us to not necessarily break the laws of physics or break the laws of reality, but really respect them and maneuver around them to, to create different, different results. Work C, I guess, um, I would show some of the spatial reality stuff. Again, um, I did with, uh, with, um, with Kanye, um, and I do not know when the Yandi album is dropping, so don't ask me that. <laughs> but some of, these are some of the works that we created um, with, with uh, Kanye, I had the fortunate um, re, uh, experience to work on album cover, stage designs that would, you know, these things propel to working on stage designs like the one seen at uh, Flogno with Kid See Ghost um, and so many different other elements. And again, these are two spatial experiences. Um, one focused on a 2D version of a spatial experience and one focused on an immersive 3D um, experience as well. And I guess I'm going to show some applications I've, I've written in the past using um, spatial reality or spatial environments in, simulated envir uh, in a simulated environment and how it allows us to do uh, or manipulate different things. Um, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> but this is a program that I, uh, I actually, let me take this ring off, um, this, uh, this is a program that I actually wrote um, when I was working um, over at Yeezy. And uh, the idea was uh, to allow us to, again, respect the laws of reality, but create spatial environments that interacted with physical matter in a simulated environment in which we could do different things. So this was essentially an NPC. Um, for those that are in music, they've probably seen something similar to this. And the goal was to create an NPC that can be played virtually um, using real hand data. Um, so with this sensor, I need to take my rings off. I don't know if the light will affect it. Um, but I can essentially go in and make music with my real hand. And this is in 3D space. So as I'm moving my hand in this 3D environment, it's translating um, there. And I can literally go in and make music. And um, this, was, uh, this is what I can show um, <laughs> with this technology. But um, this is an example of uh, really not necessarily needing to, um, for, the rea for reality to be different um, from um, a simulated environment, um, but how we can fuse the two to create unparalleled experiences. Sorry, I was back. Uh, did anyone hear anything I just said? Okay, sorry, because I know I was like real back. My apologies, my apologies, guys. Um, but that's, that's one application. Uh, I also created this. Um, application in conjunction with Nipsey, and uh, we were, again, releasing this. This is the first time I've actually publicly showed this. Um, we wanted to create an experience um, for his store where um, people could come in and interact with uh, new music virtually. Um, so another application um, where I could go in, and as I go close to the hand, um, it actually plays and streams music attached to all of these, and it's dynamically changed. Um, so we have a server where we can dynamically just change all this information and songs depending on you know, what we wanted to focus on. It could be a system that changes every day, that changes every month. Um, it, it's really, really limited. And so, um, yeah, those are just some of the design uh, ethoses or uh, guides that I use in my everyday and that I've used in the past to create some of the products um, that I've created and will continue to create. Um, and really, I, I hope that um, this talk um, has inspired you to not only use these, but just as Rams would say with his literal principles that he created, they're meant to be updated, um, they're meant to be converted, um, they're meant to be um, 
I mean, you can even apply alchemy to them to change them in a way that defines who you are, what you want to create. Um, but these are just some of mine. And um, again, I would like to thank Cyark so much um, for having me. Um, I hope you guys all enjoyed this. And I really look forward to not only um, continuing to work with not only the faculty, but the school, but also the amazing students here that I, I mean, I, I just know will go on to change the world and uh, provide solutions um, to the largest issues in the world using solution-oriented thinking over problem-based thinking. So thank you all so much, and I hope you enjoyed this. <laughs>